So I'm Lorraine Whittemore. I think I know most of you, but I'm, um, I'm a travel agent and I do a lot of small group travel and small group touring and a lot of river cruising um, and, and a lot of drinking. <laughs> we have like wine trips, scotch trips. We're just really into that. Garden trips. Um, yeah, garden has a lot of cakes and snacks, um, delicious cakes. But um, so I, and so basically I, I just wanted to pull this together to give my clients a chance to just have some fun, drink some wine together, maybe get to know one another a little bit, and then hear about a beautiful area in, in Germany and a really, um, really nice river cruise company that I, I love, Alma Waterways. Um, and just basically have some fun. Um, so that's, that's really what this is all about. I don't really have too much else to say. And then Stephen, of course, has been, you know, a phenomenal partner in all of this and has been so helpful to me. But I'm going to turn it over to Stephen. So just, I just wanted to say hi and thank you so much for coming. And we had a lot of fun in the last one. And I hope we have even more fun this time. We'll get better at it as we go along. So thank you very much, Lorraine. This is the second time. This is the second in a series of three. So the first time we presented on a nice itinerary in France. Uh, tonight, we'll look at the Rhine and the Moselle and the Mine Rivers, one itinerary. We'll do some wine tasting with Irene, our wine host. Uh, and in a couple of weeks, we have another one where we'll, we'll look at the Douro River and the port wines and the white wines along the Douro River in Portugal. Uh, but I'm going to share my screen now. We're going to go through, we'll talk a little bit about river cruising. I don't want to assume people have river cruised before, so we'll do a little bit about river cruising. Then we'll look at the region and the actual uh, cruise and, and the excursions and what we're doing from day to day. And we will intersperse in the presentation, we'll have Irene introduce some Rieslings uh, from, from these areas in Germany, okay? You know who I am. I am the, I am the regional sales manager for AMA Waterways for New England, and I'm up in Massachusetts, and that river cruising. So we have, we have a, a mantra. We have a, well, this saying came from one of our founders, uh, oceans take you to countries, rivers take you through them. Uh, I will assume that a lot of people have been on ocean cruises, but river cruising is quite different, not to compete with ocean cruising, but river cruising is really, um, become very popular over the last 10 or 15 years because it is a much more comfortable, immersive way to see these old medieval port towns and cities throughout Europe. Uh, we do most of our product is in Europe, although we do some exotic destinations in Africa, Egypt, Southeast Asia, but most of the product is in Europe. And think of the ship, the river cruise ship as your floating hotel, okay? Um, the ship, Everything is an outside stateroom on a river cruise. You have two dining rooms on the ship. Um, you have a guest lounge on the ship. You have this entertainment on the ship every night. You've got a sun deck with a heated pool on it. And all of the excursions are included in the pricing. All of your meals are included in the pricing. Beer and wine uh, for Ama Waterways is included in the pricing with your meals. And we have a happy hour every night before dinner for one hour. Let's get started here. So we will be looking at an itinerary for 2022, the, the, the middle of 2022. And the ship that will take us along these three rivers is uh, our Ama Prima. Most of our ships look like this. On the Rhine and Danube rivers, um, they go through the same lock system. So all of the ships on the Rhine and Danube are built the same length and the same width. And then what you do with the ship differentiates the different river cruise companies. For AMA Waterways, we put 156 passengers on this particular ship, and we have a crew of 45, okay? Uh, if you look, you can see most of the staterooms are twin balcony staterooms. You can see there's three levels there. There's the main deck down there with the fixed rectangular windows, and then the two decks above it, second deck, third deck, have twin balconies. So about 85% of our uh, staterooms are twin balconies, what we would call twin balconies. This is what a stateroom typically looks like for AMA waterways. Um, you've got a queen bed in there. You've got two balconies. The one to the left 
is what we refer to as a full balcony, meaning the chairs on the outside. The door opens, you go outside. In the morning, you're drinking your coffee. In the afternoon or evening, you're drinking a glass of wine as we're sailing or in port. It's, a, it's just a pleasure, it's wonderful. The balcony to the right on, the, on that image there, you can see the chairs are on the inside. That's called a French balcony in our industry, meaning that that door will slide. You can open the door, uh, but you can't sit out there. There's not the space to sit out there. So, but twin balcony for most of your staterooms is very innovative in our, in our industry. We've been doing this for many years. Um, and just a, just a very comfortable, it's about, again, because we don't put as many passengers on our ships as many of our competitors. There's more space in the stateroom. This stateroom we're looking at here is about 235 square feet, which is a very good size for our industry. Plenty of room for your stuff, put your stuff away and so on and so forth, and then still plenty of room inside the stateroom. Dining, so you understand, I won't spend a lot of time on the slide, but just so you understand, the concept of river cruising is that you're eating local cuisine every day as we're sailing and the menu changes daily based on where we are. So meaning that the food, the food and the supplies comes on the ship fresh every day. Nothing's ever frozen. This is a big deal. Uh, so you're eating all the regional and local cuisines. The left side of the menu typically is the European side of the menu. We call it the chef's menu. The right side of the menu, you can always, if you're feeling you need some comfort food, please understand at lunch, you can always get a cheeseburger and French fries uh, at dinner. If you wanna get a New York strip steak and a baked potato, it's always on the menu. So there's a static menu, that's a North American menu. And then the menu that changes every day is the European menu. And this goes for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, okay? And we make all of our own breads. We make all of our own pastries on the ship. Again, nothing is frozen. We're very proud of that. That's a very good thing. It is like a, tra a, you know, a traveling restaurant, okay? I alluded to this earlier, the sip and sail. We call it a sip and sail. It's one hour every night before dinner. We open the bar. So it's not just beer and wine, which is customary with, which is included with, with all of your meals, but it's your cocktails and your, and your, um, and your spirits. And it's a great way to meet uh, your traveling companions, meet the guests. The lounge is really well appointed. The, the, the seating in the lounge is all um, sofas, couches, uh, love seats. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really beautiful lounge with plenty of room for everyone to seat, sit comfortably. And it's panoramic in that the, all of the windows are floor to ceiling in case we're sailing at that time and you wanna see outside. It's just a, it's just a great experience. There's a piano. Uh, bar there, and we also bring on local entertainment at night. And then excursions. This is really the important thing about it. As beautiful as the ship is, and as wonderful as the cuisine is, and as great as the service is on the ship, you, you really want to know about what do I get to do every day when I get off the ship? We want you to get off the ship. We want you to get on and off the ship as many times as you like, as long as we're in port. Uh, we have all different types of excursions offered on a daily basis, and they're all included in the pricing. We have three different types of walking tours every day, gentle pace, regular pace, active pace. So nobody feels left out. If somebody might have a, a mobility issue or something like that, or they can't get around as fast or as far, you go with a gentle pace uh, group. Uh, regular pace is, is what most people can do something of a regular pace. Active pace, some people just wanna walk faster and see more, you can do that as well. We have guided hikes and we carry a fleet of bicycles on the ship. Uh, we carry about 28 bicycles on these ships uh, on the Rhine River. You can see the image to the left. Most of the rivers in Europe, if not all the rivers in Europe have bike paths along them. And you know, Europeans are big bikers anyway. So um, it's, an, it's another way to get around and you go, with guide, you go with guides. All of these are guided. And then on your own, you can get on and off the ship and explore on your own. Uh, and we encourage you to do that. And then most of our excursions uh, would end with some type of local specialty tasting. Um, uh, there's a visit to a beer garden one day where we, we taste some of the local fare and we wash it down with some of the local beer. There's a lot of wine tasting on this particular itinerary we're going to look at. There's chocolate tasting, there's cheese tasting. So we like to end each excursion with whatever the local specialty is. We'll bring you into a bakery. Uh, we'll bring you into a, you know, a vineyard and, and go into a wine cellar and, and do a tasting. 
Now this, this adds to the experience. So we're going to look at now, and this was this was this is curated. This is chosen by our host Lorraine, uh, who looks at a lot of our product and makes decisions on what she thinks her clients would like. So she really she looked at this itinerary, brought it to my attention, and said, "Steve, what do you think about the vineyards of the Rhine in Moselle?" And I said, "Actually, I have um, sailed on this itinerary twice. I, I love the itinerary. I love the Rhine, but the fact that you've got two uh, lesser known rivers that are included in the itinerary really make it a special itinerary and the most sell part of it is very special uh, and we'll talk about that a little later but so and she's actually chosen a date uh, based on some special pricing and things like that that she was able to negotiate with with uh, with my company so she's done a good job here it's a really interesting itinerary so let's look at this and so everybody understands Three different rivers now. The Rhine River, I think everyone's heard of the Rhine. Typically, the Rhine, a seven-night sailing, would, would start in Amsterdam and go down to Basel, Switzerland, and you'd go through the Netherlands and Germany and France and then end in Switzerland. But here, we're also going to do the Main River, a little bit on the Main. Uh, the Main River is the river that connects the Rhine with the Danube River. So not a lot of people sail on this for, for leisure reasons. Most the, the, the Main is usually you know, commercial, um, you know, uh, ships going back and forth and connecting the Rhine to the Danube. And then this really special part of this itinerary is the Moselle River, which is the is a is exclusively German river. You'll see as you go th along the Moselle that Germans, the German people, uh, vacation here. They have, a lot of them have vacation homes along the river. You'll see families outside barbecuing you'll see you know father and sons fishing on the banks of the river it's a really nice river it's not a big wide river like the Rhine River it's a, it's a much smaller river um, it's just a beautiful setting so three rivers one itinerary and then just a quick map not to scale so you understand we'd start in Amsterdam up in the north uh, northwest part of that map there and we'll go we'll go down Cologne will be the first stop and then we'll go uh, down to Mainz, or Landstein, Rudersheim, Mainz, and then back. We'll backtrack, get on the Mosul River there, and jut down there, Kochem and Bernkassel. And then we'll end in Luxembourg. So that's your itinerary, uh, a basic look at your itinerary. And one of the reasons I like this is the ending in Luxembourg, because there's really no river cruises that I'm aware of that end there except this one. And I thought it was unique because a lot of people have already done Amsterdam to Basel. So right. some That's people are looking right. for something different. Right. And we, we can talk about pre and post. The pre and post opportunities would be Amsterdam. They could be Paris. They could be Luxembourg. They can be what you want. That's why you use somebody, you use a travel advisor uh, because we don't necessarily do it all cookie cutter like that. But you could, you could say to Lorraine, well, I want to do Amsterdam as the pre but I don't want to do Paris as the post like the cruise company does. I want to do Luxembourg and she can do that for you. Right. So this is, this is why, I mean, our, our company only sells through travel advisors. You won't see us on television. Um, we, we just have a different business model, right? We, we work with travel advisors. So the other reason that Lorraine chose the itinerary is because she was fascinated uh, by the concept of the Floriad Expo once every 10 year, um, horticultural, botanical, agricultural expo that moves around in Europe. And in 2022, it's actually going to be just outside of Amsterdam. So she thought that would be a wonderful opportunity uh, to do some river cruising, but also to visit Floriad. So this itinerary on the second day while we're still in Amsterdam, uh, we, spend, we spend the second part of the day, the second half of the day, at Floriad, it's included in the cruise. Um, and then also if you wanted to do more than what we do, uh, you could do the pre, um, the, the pre two nights in Amsterdam and then do some more Floriad on your own, depending on how much you're into that. But so you understand what Floriad is, um, it is this huge expo that happens every 10 years, different places in Europe uh, it runs from uh, the middle of April to roughly the middle of October. And this is going to be the case for 2022. 
Uh, it's happening in a town about 20 minutes outside of Amsterdam. And they're, they're basically, it's, it's like the, uh, the old World's Fair. They're setting it up now. They're building, they're building the structures and putting everything together now for this time next year, basically, okay? Um, and the theme, there's usually a theme, and the theme for 2022 is going to be, you know, keeping the world green, making the world greener. So it's not just about, it is about botanical, uh, you know, gardens and beautiful flowers and things like that, but it's also about agriculture and growing things and, and um, you know, giving back to the earth and things like that. So it's going to be very topical. Uh, I do, I do sell quite a few groups to universities and, and, and um, uh, what is the, there's another, uh, the garden, garden clubs and things like that are, are, are interested in these things. So, so varied interests would have interest in the Floriad. I, I myself am very interested in it. I don't, I don't get to necessarily pick and choose when I go. It's usually my company telling me when I go and what, what groups to lead. Um, but I hope that they choose me. To, I, I want to get to see Floriad. So that is included in this particular itinerary. And then we start in Amsterdam, like I said, so easy flight to Amsterdam from the Northeast. In Amsterdam, I mentioned you could do a pre-night. You can do a couple of pre-nights. Um, if there's things you want to do, uh, you know, we spend a full day in Amsterdam in the area. Uh, but if there's if there's things you want to do over and above that, vi visiting the Anne Frank House requires um, pre-booking of tickets. If you wanted to do that, if that's on your on your bucket list, you'd want to come in ahead of time and do that. There's a lot of wonderful museums in Amsterdam, great neighborhoods, great cuisine. Um, I've been many, many times in my career uh, and I never get tired. There's always something new and different to do. It's a great walking city. Um, it's just uh, very eclectic. I mean, there's just so many different quarters, different sections of the city, all are interesting. Uh, but again, that's something that Lorraine can help you with. If you, if you say to Lorraine, I'm, I'm a huge art fan, there are some of the best uh, museums in Europe or in Amsterdam, right? So um, these are things to consider. Cologne, Germany. Uh, this is a major city along the route here. On this, now we're on the Rhine River now. This is a great day. You can do a bike tour here. You can do a hike here. This is the famous cathedral in Cologne. Started, they started building this in the 12th century and didn't finish building it uh, till like the 18th, in the 1860s maybe. It took them a long time, a lot of money. Um, it's a wonderful visit. It's a, it's a beautiful city. Uh, has the dubious distinction of being the most bombed city uh, in uh, during World War II by the Allies. So uh, really interesting culturally. And then we, we do offer here uh, on the walking tour, we offer a wonderful visit to a just a regular beer garden, a very famous, very old beer garden. Just, on, just behind that cathedral by about a block or so is this beer garden where all the locals hang out all the rugby, all the regional rugby teams hang out there. Their jerseys are hanging from the rafters and they sit in these bench, these, these long like picnic tables uh, with benches. And they, and we, you know, it's, it's included, it's included in the excursions. You go there with your, with your walking group and they give you uh, potato blintzes and they give you other local, local appetizers. And then you wash it down with their regional Kolsch beer. And I, these are the, this is what really makes, um, I think river cruising a really special way of seeing these old uh, towns and cities is that you you're it's immersive you're with the locals you're not doing real touristy things you're eating and drinking in a in a restaurant where the locals are right um, and I've done this is another thing that I've done probably a dozen times in my career with colleagues with family with friends and I I love it I I absolutely love the place uh, I love the beer I love the food and I love just being with you know regular working class German people on this particular day. So this is a great visit. Now this is Rudesheim. Uh, this will be our first Irene uh, wine tasting because Rudesheim is, is along, the Rhine, uh, along the Rhine River, but also some of the best Rieslings uh, in probably in the world. I mean, if you talk to a German person, they would say the best Rieslings come from Rudesheim or along the Moselle River. We definitely make the best Rieslings. So, I will reintroduce um, 
Irene, and she'll come and do her first uh, wine experience with you. Hi. <laughs> so I, I beg to differ. <laughs> I think, uh, can you guys see this bottle? So this is a uh, Schloss Volraz. Um, this is from Rengau, and uh, it is the oldest um, vineyard, I believe, um, in Germany. They, they have a receipt from the museum that when somebody sold uh, some bottles uh, that dates back to 1280. So that's how long this, this family's been making Rieslings. Um, several generations. Um, and the first one we're having actually, I should introduce the Riesling. It's a, it's a Qualitas vine. So we're going to start. So German wines have uh, four levels of uh, classification. And we're just going to start from the middle and up. So we're going to do uh, the, the number two. Um, so there are different ratings. Um, and Qualitas vine, uh, or commonly known as QBA, definitely has met some levels of, um, of what's the word? Um, of quality to be, and, and has come from a certain region. So um, they are definitely uh, wines that you feel free to put on the table and, and serve to your company and not go, oh, it's just some crappy Riesling that people, when, when people talk about Rieslings, they go, it's, it's just all sweet, right? But it's not, because if you get the white Riesling, like the ones that we're tasting here, um, yes, they are sweet, but they also have really good acidity and so they really, really, um, to me, are so food friendly, um, especially for Easter that's coming up, right? So this is actually one of the wines I did a little wine tasting uh, for Easter wines uh, this weekend. And this was one of the wines that we featured um, because it pairs well with, um, if you were having turkey, you were having ham, it actually um, pairs with it, pretty much most spicy foods. Um, but this um, Riesling, this QBA is on the uh, driest end of the three reasons we're gonna have tonight. Um, and this is the only one at the QBA level. Next to our much is sort of the top top tier of, of Riesling wines. Um, and in the big scheme of things, I'm not a geography uh, expert, but uh, the Moselle's up, up here north of the river bank, I believe. And Rengau is sort of, as you wander into uh, a little bit closer to Frankfurt, I believe this uh, area is about an hour west of Frankfurt. So, and how do I know this? Because I'm going to fly to Frankfurt just so I can go visit these guys. And I looked on the map and I'm like, yeah, it's about 45 minute drive. <laughs> um, but anyway, so um, uh, QBA uh, Rieslings are not super expensive um, for the quality that they are. And so they're usually about nine, between nine and nine and a half percent of ABV. So you know it's going to be slightly drier. So if you don't know about ABV in wines, the lower the ABV, the sweeter the wine is. So we're going to get all the way down to 7.5 when we get to our third one. Um, and um, compared to the um, wines of Mosul, this one doesn't have as much of that um, uh, fuelly nose, if you know what I'm talking about. You know, sometimes when you have a, a Riesling from Mosul, as soon as you know that you know it's a Riesling from Mosul because it's got like a kind of a, not, not kerosene, but definitely a fuel kind of nose. This one's actually quite well balanced. I don't smell much of it. On, on this one. Really yeah, if you really smell hard, you can smell a, just a hint of it. So to me, that's really it's nice because it kind of really, yeah, kind of kerosene like, but it makes it very, very uh, you know, uh, very well balanced. Um, and if I don't know what you guys are drinking, if you have a one that is of this level at QBA, uh, it should have, it should be sweet, but match really well with acidity. So that what happens when you take a sip, I'm going to take a sip because I've been talking a bit already. And you swallow it, um, makes your mouth water. Like you want to have some more. You want to have another sip, right? <laughs> so if you um, and but and this is really really food friendly. Um, for me, um, I had this a um, couple of weeks ago with uh, some sashimi. If you like fish, and it pair with the um, wasabi uh, that you have. With your, if you have a little bit extra wasabi, you can just wash it down with your riesling because it just kind of balances it really nicely. Uh, or Mexican food, um, or even if you're e eating Italian, you don't have to drink Italian wine if you wanted to drink, uh, like if you're having a um, something spicy. Uh, what's a spicy Italian dish? Um, Fradiato. Okay, yep. So you could have it with that because the, the sweetness is going to take away the heat. So now all of a sudden, you know, it becomes a really nice pairing. So anyway, so enough of, about this wine. We've got two more wines to talk about. 
Well, so and so you understand that the town of Rudesheim is a beautiful, small medieval town, uh, lots of vineyards, uh, many excursions to this town. You can do a bike ride. There's a there's a, a local choo choo train that takes you through the town. You can get on that and do that. What I like to do in Rudesheim, I do with my family two summers ago. Uh, there's a, 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 a there is a yeah a gondola ride that takes you just about 30 feet above the ground above through the vineyards and you go up to the high point of the town you can look down on the river and you can look down on the rest of the town uh, it's a lot of fun uh, that gondola ride ends with a with a wine tasting I believe so really nice easy town to walk around or bike around just a beautiful town. Now we'll look at some of the towns along the Moselle River. There's a beautiful shot of the Moselle. Uh, you can see just from this one image here, the, how much smaller a river. It's not a big wide river. There's not tons of commercial traffic on the Moselle. It's not, it's not a big, uh, it's, it's kind of winds. It's more snakes through the valley there. Um, you can see how fertile the, the, the river valley is. Um, just a beautiful river. This is, this is actually where we make, it, you make a right turn off of the Rhine and you get onto the Moselle from this, uh, this town here, Koblenz in Germany. Uh, and the, the, I should have mentioned this earlier. When you go through the Moselle, uh, you will notice early on that you could easily be somewhere in ancient Rome because this was part of the Roman Empire back in the day, because the Romans understood about growing things, and they, you know, they saw this uh, microclimate, they saw this, this beautiful, fertile river valley, and they, and they made it theirs. So as we go along the Moselle, we will stop in places, and you will see structures still standing that look like miniature ver versions of the Colosseum. You'll see a lot of Romanesque architecture as you go through here, and starting with Koblenz. It's a very interesting town, uh, great walking town. That little promenade there, uh, which kind of, kind of, that's the fork in the road, so to speak, between the Rhine and the Moselle, um, is very popular. People uh, go out there and 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 uh, and sun themselves and hang out, and there's some nice uh, statues there. Koblenz is just a beautiful town, but it's our first, it's our first foray onto the Moselle. And then we're, we're in Mainz, Germany. Uh, and the, the most interesting part of Mainz, again, medieval city. Uh, this is the capital of Rhineland, which is the region that it's in, uh, ancient capital of, of Rhineland in Germany. And the, the best thing I can show you here are the, uh, we visit the stained glass uh, windows of Marc Chagall's in the St. Stephen Church in the old part of the city. Uh, Marc Chagall, you know, was a, a what, a Russian-born uh, Jewish painter from the last century, a modern painter, um, did a lot of modernist work, um, and later in his career he started doing stained glass, uh, mostly for synagogues and churches, and in the late 70s, later in his, I think he was already probably close to 80, he did these stained glasses in St. Stephen's uh, Cathedral here. And then we, um, the other thing that mine is known for is um, the peaches, okay, in the, in the Mosul area, the peaches. And I think this is our next uh, wine break. Uh, with, well, back to Irene now. I think, I thought, I'm pretty sure she had something that had a hint of peach in it or had some peach in there. Yeah. The pe pe peaches are definitely a um, one of the, the most common, um, you know, um, on the palate and nose for, for a, a Riesling. So my second Riesling, also from the same vineyard, uh, is uh, a cabinet. I don't know if you can see that. So it, well, all, that, all that means is it's, uh, so this one is a part of Cuts Vine. Uh, so it's sort of the the top uh, the top twenty five percent in terms of of um, uh, quality of wines. So cabinet literally translates to a cabinet, and what that means is um, the wine is of such good quality that you can actually lay it down. Right, you don't really lay it down, but you you could lay it down. Um, it's it's why it's called cabinet wine. 
Um, in terms of sweetness, compared to the uh, QBA we had before, this one's gonna be a little bit sweeter. And I think, I believe the first one was 9% alcohol, no, nine and a half. This one's only 9%. Um, I just opened this wine not too long ago. And that's when I first, first pour for me, because my nose comes from hell and it smells everything. I was like, boy, it smells kind of funky, but it, it washes off really, really quickly. It's just, it's, it's, I believe it's just part of the terroir that they just have this really, um, what do they call them? Uh, th these volatiles in, in, in the wine uh, that, that just kind of need to gas off a little bit. So, so definitely don't get one of these, pour it right away and then drink it because you need to let it air out as you do with most wines, but even with, with this white, you definitely want to do that. Um, definitely on the sweeter side. So yeah, so you, your food can get spicier. Uh, I never used to like white wines, let alone Rieslings because I don't like sweet wines, but when I've discovered uh, really good Rieslings that, that have really good acidity to balance the, um, the, the, the heat and the sweetness, all of a sudden now it's like, wow, you know, if we have spicy foods, I almost always, and I never used to have Rieslings in my cabinet, uh, down in the basement, but now I do. And so, um, yes, it has just a hint of a little, uh, almost like a, in Italian, it would be like a frizzante. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Irene. We'll come back to you in a few minutes then. So when you're traveling on an itinerary like this, um, you'll be doing something similar, like a wine tasting like this, but you'll be in a wine cellar that's 600 years old. And you know somebody's great 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 granddaughter will be doing the wine tasting for you. You know, um, so it's 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 interesting. It's fun. Uh, you take a lot of notes. You try to you try to figure out which wines you can you can get when you come back here, or speak to someone like Irene when you come back. See if they carry those wines. And this is why you do things like this, right? To learn to learn about uh, just to, to broaden your palate a little bit. So this stretch here, uh, we're back. Uh, so on the Rhine River, the Rhine River is noted for um, castles. So if you have in your mind the Rhine River, castles, fairy tales, things like that, uh, there is a stretch on the Rhine River called the Rhine Gorge. And it's about 28 kilometer stretch where we see 43 to 45 genuine, authentic castles. Uh, and so we make sure we are, when we're sailing this stretch, we have everyone come up on the sun deck and the cruise manager gets on the PA and does a very na nice narration of what we're seeing, uh, some facts about, the, about the, the various castles. But here you go here uh, in, um, in, let's see, where am I? I'm in Lanstein now. So in Lanstein, uh, this is Lanek Castle. This is a wonderful visit. Uh, a couple of years back when I did this itinerary, we actually visited this castle around dusk and it was brilliant. It sort of added to the, uh, the eeriness <laughs> of the castle. It's, it, it's, I mean, this is like seven or 800 years old. I don't remember the exact, what, the, when it was built exactly, but this is, goes back to really, uh, you know, medieval times, early medieval times, a beautiful visit, uh, beautiful area. You'll see a common theme here as we go through here. This is Kochem. Now, when you say some of these, these old German words, you have to, it sounds like you're clearing your throat. So Kochem is how it's pronounced. Um, and this is, I think this is um, Reinstein, Reinstein, Reinstein Castle. This is another wonderful visit. And if you notice that the castles are always set on the high point, of the town or the village or the city. And this is simply just because they had to defend the town from you know, invading folks uh, coming up or down river. So the vineyards along these rivers are not big uh, corporations. They're not big, uh, big vineyards company-wise. They are family vineyards still, you know, vineyards that have been in the family for, for generations. Um, and you can actually see in the background that you can see three river ships lined up there on the, uh, on the left bank. Uh, so you can see, you just see, this is a typical scene of what you see uh, sailing along these rivers. In Kochem, we do, we also do, we don't just do wine tastings. Uh, we do a mustard tasting if that's something you want to do. It's fun. Uh, you learn something. 
uh, and hopefully you come back and maybe you're, again, your palate has changed some when you go back to the States. Some vineyards, and I think this is our, uh, our next uh, wine tasting. We'll, we'll, we'll invite our, our favorite wine host back uh, to, uh, to show us her, her next offering. Okay, um, so the last wine is the uh, Spratlesa. Ah. ah, yes. So this is okay. 7.5% alcohol only, so you know there's a lot of residual sugars in there. Um, this, this wine is uh, definitely the, the sweetest of the lot, which now tells me you, your food can get even spicier. But at the same time, you can also maybe pair it with uh, some blue cheese. Right, because it's 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 sweet enough to the point where I'm thinking I you know if I was in France I'd be drinking a, a sauterne, um, and I always almost always have it with blue cheese just because it the uh, the saltiness um, really cuts the sweetness so it's a really nice balance. Um, and let's see, what did they say to pair it with Asian curries? Perfect, my favorite food uh, as mm -hmm. far as spicy foods go. So this would be one that uh, you can definitely experiment with, um, pretty much any Thai foods or even Mexican food. So you wouldn't think of Mexican food and, and, um, and a Riesling, a German Riesling, but can guarantee you'll really enjoy it. And then- okay. Wrap it up. Yeah, so, this is, so let's, bring this, let's bring this home then. So then the, the, last, the last stop here uh, on the Mosul River is Burnt Castle. Uh, this uh, is Castle Lanschutz. Okay, this castle here it was built in the ninth century. This, this is a really interesting castle, uh, obviously not in the exact same shape that some of the other castle, castles are in, uh, but this is a, a, a great town. Uh, Burke Castle is a great town for wine tasting and they have, uh, they have a lot of um, uh, wine festivals here throughout the season. They have um, a lot of uh, wine bars here. So this is what it's known for. It's a great way to end this particular trip and again, you know, it's it's a really interesting itinerary in that you've got you know a blend of three different rivers there, uh, the Rhine, uh, the Main, and the Mosel rivers, and these just truly, you know, it's like going back in time when you visit a lot of these towns. They they parts of the towns, the old center parts of the town, look like you could still be in, in medieval times. So really interesting stuff. Beautiful region. Um, excellent cuisine. We didn't really talk much about the cuisine because we're talking about wines tonight, but excellent cuisine as well. And then I think, yeah, so I, I, we're going to just preview our next, I think the next time we get together and do this, um, we're going to look at the Douro River in Portugal and we will do some port wine tasting and we'll do some, there's some, also some lovely white wines. Uh, I will leave that to Irene. I'm not. I'm not the wine expert here. Irene um, is so. because it's a. It, it's almost an art form. People that are into their port wines really get into the subtle differences uh, in in the in the port wines. Something that I can't pick up. And then also uh, the the white wines in Portugal are very drinkable as well. Very easy to drink, and not expensive here in the states. And there's a, I mean, listen, I, you know, we, we see we're focusing on wine, obviously, but the Douro River is a wonderful, uh, a wonderful trip. Portugal, I love the cuisine. I'm up in Massachusetts. I'm in the southeast part of Massachusetts. So a lot of uh, Portuguese restaurants near where I, where I live. My neighbors, half my neighbors are Portuguese. Uh, I love the cuisine in Portugal. So we'll have another nice trip there uh, in a couple of weeks. And then...